Welcome, members and guests. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you might be today. I'm Tom Skura, uh, VP of Content and Programs for the Cybersecurity Collaborative. I'll be moderating this session. I am pleased to have as our panelist, uh, Devin Bryan. Uh, Devin has a distinguished uh, career as a uh, CISO, um, former CISO for MUFG Union Bank. Uh, KPMG, the Federal Reserve System, and ADP. Uh, Devin uh, was a member of, of our executive committee, uh, steering uh, and providing guidance uh, to the collaborative in terms of our programs. Devin, welcome. We really appreciate you being here uh, to share your insights on uh, IT asset management. So thanks again for joining us. Thanks um, for having me, Tom. Great being here. Absolutely. A couple of housekeeping items for everyone. Uh, we, we obviously don't have an open mic here. Uh, it, it, it never works with a large size audience. So uh, please put your questions in the chat box. Uh, we'll try to get to them. Uh, we, we will have a session uh, for answering those questions. So we'll get to them certainly then. Um, at the end, there will be some poll questions. Uh, please hold on and, and then uh, you know respond to those. We, we welcome your feedback. We want to make sure these sessions are valuable to you and uh, certainly improve as we go along. I also remind you, if you uh, have some security privacy credentials, uh, this is worth one CPE. Uh, for members, uh, we do track that. For non-members, uh, if you need some something to substantiate that, uh, we'll give you a, a, an email at the end of the presentation. You can get a, uh, you get a copy of the presentation so you can use to uh, do that. So uh, let me first, before we get into the content, I just want to remind uh, everyone here, both members and non-members, of what we're all about at the Collaborative in terms of creating value for our leaders. And you can, you can see uh, the slide and, and look at some of the member benefits and uh, some of the, the, the value creation you get out of being a member. I, I do want to just sort of step back and just say that the power of collaboration and information sharing makes us all better security officers and professionals and our organizations better prepared. Why? Because we are all sharing uh, common concerns, uh, threats, and practices uh, that we put in place uh, with each other. And members really do that here. And that's the value of being here, not just from the content we create of our task force, but for member contributed content. I, I wanna call out two things that we've gotten from members. Uh, uh, one is a, just recently a daily, uh, a data security addendum that is attached to third party contracts that really calls out responsibilities and liabilities to third parties as a big, that was a big area of need and uh, thank our members for providing that. And uh, we're in the middle of a big uh, ransomware uh, task force and uh, one member put together a pay or not to pay decision criteria list, uh, which is something we all wish we didn't, we don't want to have happen, but it, it can. And it's, it was a very good uh, guidance document for members. The point is we create content out of the task force, but members are contributing content. And when you're here, you have the value of collaborating with members through a number of different ways, peer-to-peer uh, -peer direct messaging, CISO asks the expert rapid response. You have a uh, chance to uh, put in a question and other CISOs chime in. We do have a library of CISO developed tools and resources. And one thing as a member, you get every morning uh, faithfully, I think at 6.30 a.m. Eastern is the daily morning security report. Uh, you will never be blindsided uh, by coming into your office virtually or physically and, uh, ask, and then uh, being asked a question about a breach and not being aware of what has happened. And we use that too in our task forces. We're cleaning out uh, a lot of the ransomware articles that occur every morning uh, in that regard. So, uh, so again, we're open for non-members. If you have any questions, uh, we'll give you a contact number at the end of this. And for our members, we're here to make sure you are getting value uh, through collaboration. So I'm um, I would just um, I would just quickly add that sure. certainly um, you know developments in the attack landscape is certainly a huge future feature of the daily morning report, but also featured within the daily daily morning reports are you know interesting developments across the cyber threat landscape. Right, many of us 
um, subscribe to various channels for breach updates, right? So we certainly um, want to make sure that we cover that as a part of the daily morning report, but it also covers interesting, you know, and pertinent developments across the industry in general that informs, to your point, you know, how we start our day as, you know, practitioners at various levels across our respective organizations and industries. So I look at it not just for, you know, what were the latest breaches from the past 24 hours, but also what are, you know, interesting developments across the, you know, cyber threat landscape that I ought to be aware of before I start my day. That's an excellent point. And, and we'll call out some major research search on that basis. I, I think you're, I mean, I read about all the ransomware events and how people respond to them, but there are articles that talk in general about preparedness. And uh, one, one of which came out was the fact that two thirds of people felt that they really didn't have the tools to address the ransomware attack, which was rather shocking, but it got into you know, why that is. So thanks for calling that out. It isn't just the breaches, but you know, key articles and as CISOs, uh, you know, some information that help guide your programs. Excellent point. And it comes out every day, uh, as we said. So what we will get into is the case for the I, uh, an ITAM program, which is IT asset management uh, abbreviated. Uh, this has been discussed since the dawn of security. Um, and, you know, what does it really mean and why it's important? And, and how do you, how do we tackle putting a program together is what we'll be talking about. We'll talk a little bit about the task force. Uh, this really centers around the implementation guide, which was the guidance put together uh, by the task force. So you, if you're in a task force and you're in meetings, you're getting gui guidance at every meeting and you can connect with your, your peers on it. But at the end of the task force, we do put together uh, guides. In some cases, we'll put together other tools that members have provided or ones that we create. What we'll be talking about today, a little bit about asset definition and scopes, but you know, what really are the components uh, that you need to have to put a program in place? What are the steps to implement it? What, how do you uh, address various life cycle phases? And we'll get into FAQs and, and Devin will help us there in terms of you know, what, what questions people uh, normally have and key takeaways. Uh, we'll conclude this with new task force initiatives uh, and, and uh, address your questions at the end of this. So Devin, we talked a little bit about the, the case for the ITAM program in preparation for this and you opened my eyes up to this. I'm gonna put down the standard things and, uh, and then we can talk a little bit about some of the things you added, but maybe feel free to add to these. Um, this is everyone who's been audited has been told by myself included, it's been told by another, you need to know uh, what you know, what you need to protect. If you don't know what you need to protect, you can't protect it. Um, and, and that's a, a true platitude, but <laughs> You know, implementing that is, is a whole different story, you know, figuring out what it is and who's going to do it and how you do it uh, is, is another start of it. Another case is having the technical opportunity to continuously protect these assets and threats. So it isn't you patch something once. It isn't you just you define a, find a vulnerability once a year. You're continuously identifying weaknesses and correcting them through some systematic technological means. And technical is very important to the discussion of the ITAM program. Helping ensure service availability uh, is a you know, you know, standard IT basis availability being part of IT operations it is also a security paradigm uh, is important as well. And uh, some companies begin their program by right-sizing licensing costs and the reducing the potential violations of use. They, they come in and look at a savings and in doing so, they then expand to the other important things. So Devin, these cover some of the basic things. Is there anything else that you might wanna add here in terms of why, you know, why would someone wanna embark on a big program like this? I, I think Tom, these are, um, you know, these bullets certainly kind of summarizes the, the business case for ITAM at a major level. If there's any, I'll, I'll double click on it would be the first one, right? Um, yeah. And it anchors around, you know, know thyself, 
from a first principles perspective. Many of us as practitioners or students of military history will of course point to Sun Tzu, Art of War. Know thy enemy, but first and foremost, know thyself and you'll be successful in a thousand battles, right? But you absolutely have to know what you are protecting. You know, certainly if you, if you don't know what you have, how can you protect it, right? And if you don't know what you have, and if you can't see what you have, how can you defend it? Right, so certainly, you know, knowing thyself from a table stakes first principles perspective really drives much of what goes into a very mature, a very robust, a very impactful IT asset management strategy. Absolutely, and we'll want to talk about um, why is it that come some companies, you know, many are still struggling to do this. And we'll get into this a little bit. I'd like to hear your perspectives uh, because it's fundamental, I think, to any security program. It's, it's a fundamental need and, and a point to know what you need to protect. But, uh, you know, why are people struggling? And I think we'll, we'll get into that as we talk here. This is something that you brought to, up to my attention, uh, Dev, and I credit you with this. <laughs> yeah. Staring me right in the face. Uh, first two CIS controls are all about inventory and, and you know, control of enterprise assets and software assets. We talk about uh, CS top you know, 20 and, and uh, so forth. Very influential, um, you can benchmark against it. But yes, if you, if you, you, know, if you wanna have a good security program, you really have to have a good inventory and, and manage those assets. And again, what you brought to my attention and again too, is the first category, then this cybersecurity framework, TSF, uh, talks about identify your assets right right away. So uh, so fundamentally, to be able to enhance and manage other parts of your program, you, you need this in place. And we'll talk about what that is and how you go about doing. That's the basis on it. But uh, you know, major security standards are advocating for this. And of course, the CSF came and brought all this up to that level and. Asset management is number one. And the other point I wanna show you why this is important is, is to bring this home to the current threat landscapes. I wanna ask everyone to read this and I'm not gonna read it too. But I think what you see here is uh, old cold fusion vulnerability exploited for the Kring ransomware deployment. So the danger and the things we fear about are old systems that are still running that weren't patched because it was too risky to patch them and maybe they weren't mitigated by other means and they're still out there. And uh, so we worry, you know, we used to worry about them being exploited by, by hacker. Now, you know, yes, they're exploited by hackers uh, who now hold us for ransom. And it's a, it's a potential launching point uh, for, for these things. And I also, I also have to add, so, so if you think ITAM's not relevant, or maybe it's an old concept, it's a old concept that needs to be implemented, perhaps in newer ways than originally. And it's an old concept that if not implemented, uh, can result in exploitation in a very, very serious threat that still persists, and that's in ransomware. And I have to also add, it, it, you know, sort of in the ransomware task force, uh, one of the members did have a good ITAM asset management program that basically uh, alerted uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to uh, privilege escalation on a particular server. So it was all set up to do that which is a, a characteristic of, of, of ransomware, uh, you know, uh, find a home and then try to escalate privileges to, to get into the box and put on the malware. Uh, so by having a good program that included the alerting, uh, they were able to stop ransomware before it had gone on into its uh, uh, exploitation uh, effects. So anyway, I don't know, Devin, if, if you know, here's some real world examples why this is still very important in terms of today, you know, addressing today's threats. Yeah, I completely agree, Tom. Um, and we think about place in the context, um, as you said, of you know what's top of mind for cyber defenders, right? Irrespective of industry, market segment, or size of organization right now, right? It's you know, certainly, you know, threats from ransomware um, percolates top of mind. 
Um, and we think about, you know, what are the targets, right? It's less about bricking the devices themselves and holding the devices ransom. It's about holding the data on those devices ransom, right? And so certainly again, anchoring on first principles, know what you have, know what state it is. You've got to know what you have in order to protect it, right? Um, you know, continue to see the case made for robust IT asset management in so many different ways in light of the real world threat that we have to defend against as cyber practitioners. Thank you very much, Devin, for that. So I'd like to uh, talk a little about, uh, about the task forces, how they work in, the, in, in what gets created out of these. I, I touched on that initially. Uh, here we have uh, a collaboration of, of government uh, organizations and uh, uh, nonprofit organizations uh, and uh, you know large organizations that were working together uh, to uh, share their best practices and successes and, and uh, talk about this all the way through it. Um, they shared what worked, what didn't work. Uh, what, what their challenges were. Um, and I just want to point out, as much as we produced uh, content that uh, summarized the key best practices and lessons learned from these task forces, that each task force has a specific agenda and members are able to collaborate and share with them. So um, it, I, I urge members to uh, join these task forces and new members to come in and become part of these. We are expanding the number of them. We are soliciting our CISOs for uh, which ones are, are very important to them. And uh, you know, we're looking forward to many, many more uh, in a variety of different areas next year. But they are, you know, the, the point is the value you get out of them is in the interaction, member contribution, and then what we do uh, when the task force is completed. So I'm gonna just uh, delve in a little bit, uh, and this is for members, for new members, if you join, you will get this. And again, the chance to collaborate in this area, I'm sure we'll be coming back to this next year. This is a guidance document um, for you know, establishing your program. We believe there are seven components required to make it effective, we'll talk about that. Uh, three program implementation steps with 10 program success criteria. Uh, and then we provide guidance on five operating, uh, uh, operating five life cycle phases. Uh, it has FAQs and dependencies to talk about roles and responsibilities and some guidance on the use of ITAM tools. Uh, by the way, it, I just wanna point out, uh, uh, you know, our philosophy on tools and vendors. You, uh, we are not a vendor-sponsored organization. Uh, vendors don't come in and get email addresses. But we do uh, 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 allow our members to talk about specific tools we are using to share their experiences. Maybe they've had configuration problems. Those do get discussed. Uh, we don't advocate for them, but we recognize that tools are important you know, to, to running your program. Uh, it's just, this is not uh, something that we are sponsored by any vendors and, and, uh, and that allows for free sharing of information. So um, I won't read all of this. Uh, Devin, I think you brought out one, one thing about IT. You know, we talk about IT assets and information assets and uh, you can get into a large discussion no matter what standard you're using on that. Um, generally, it's a computing, I, I won't get into all of this, it's part of our, um, it, it's in the guidance document, it, it is a computing vice that's connected, because, uh, and, you know, it, it stores or process transmits information, uh, it, it could be attached to computing device, so it could, you know, it's something connected to the network and or it stores or process transmissions, if it could store, it's, it's not connected, it's still an IT asset, I think the underlying uh, Key point is that the data sensitivity is a driver, although an IT asset can be a target for a, a DDoS attack and so forth as well. Um, and I would say IoT devices and uh, ICS SCADA devices could be considered 
part of the scope of IT assets. Would you would you agree, Devin, on that? Um, I completely agree, Tom. Um, you know, as practitioners, um, some of us will have or already does have responsibility, not just for the IT infrastructures within our respective companies, but also the OT infrastructures, right? And as such, you know, many of the first principle concepts that we apply to securing our IT infrastructures have to be extended logically to the OT infrastructures, right? And, you know, today's conversation is about, you know, first principles, knowing what you have, right? Much as we focus um, on, you know, what do we have on the IT network, right? You know, the same considerations and priority and attention and resources have also to be assigned to the same, answering the same conversations for the OT side of the house, right? I, I would not you know, make such a clear distinction between, you know, securing your IT environment, your OT environment, especially as it pertains to IT asset management. Um, because again, if you don't know what you have, how can you protect it? If you don't know what you have running, what, you know, can see it, how can you defend against it, right? So I think those first principles apply irrespective of IT or OT environments. I would also add, Tom, something you touched on that I know, that across our industry, there are differing schools of thought on data as an asset, as an IT asset, right? Um, I am of the perspective that certainly the crown jewels of our organization is really the data, right? And as such, if you know we're defending our organizations, you know we definitely have to give due consideration to how are we protecting the crown jewels, which is in fact not the databases themselves but what resides in those databases, right? And so from a, you know, IT asset management perspective, um, a comprehensive IT asset management perspective, we cannot ignore the data that sits in sensitive repositories and not just the repositories, structured repositories aside, but also the unstructured, you know, data that has, you know, corporate, you know, intellectual property and other types of, of you know, crown jewel information for companies, um, you know, that should also fall within um, and be party to how we deliver IT asset management best practices for our companies. Uh, yes, I think that's a good point. I think it draw. you know, isn't technology and systems to help identify where this data are located going to be crucial to making this successful, I think, right? I mean, it's, it's not a manual process and probably where people are at, if they haven't got an inventory now, they have to figure out how to get it. I, I think the point is, uh, folks, you have to invest in the technologies to, to make this ha happen and to be able to sustain this, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, technology plays a huge role. Um, you know, I'd also add that um, you know, of equal importance are the processes right, surrounding IT asset management, right? You know, so this is less about, you know, running, you know, your scanners, your IT asset discovery scanners, right? And populating, you know, whatever that centralized, you know, management system is, right? There are processes that also support a robust IT asset management practice that has to factor and has to weigh heavily into maturing your IT asset management strategy, right? So um, posted in the chat was a question around CMDB, right? That is an important part of it, but it is not the panacea because it's less again about the technology, the supporting processes in maintaining the accuracy of that, you know, your IT asset management repository, your CMDB is also critical as well in you know in maturing the practice around IT asset management so the process is important i guess the, the question was is a cmdb an essential part isn't a repository you, you have to have something you have to have something that you're, you're you're managing but like if the processes are terrible and you're not integrating that with uh, other systems then it's going to be not as useful right is that a fair completely agree completely agree okay okay 
Uh, good. All right. So I, I just want to move on to the next slide. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll walk through this in a second, but I want to come back to OT assets, personal IT assets, and cloud assets. And maybe, uh, Devin, you can you have weighed in on the importance of looking at those. Uh, but uh, I'll get to, a, a, I want to come back to you in a second to talk about how, are, you know, if you're a CISO and you don't have visibility OT assets, how, how do you begin to do that? You know, it's obviously important, but I, I, let me jump through and just say, uh, you can read this uh, as well as I can speak it. You know, you want to reduce the risks of data compromise, loss of availability, consequences from the breaches and, 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 and software license use. That, that is an objective. You may not start trying to do all things, but, um, and obviously these are met when, when you've got all the assets uh, uh, in sight, they properly configured, you know, you're going to be continually doing this. And you also deal with the, with the um, proper disposal of that. And we'll get into that a little bit more, but I want to go back to, uh, and shadow IT as well. Because, uh, you know, you may be fine for your IT organization, but if the personal IT assets that are being used in BOIOD are protected, the OT assets, you know, you may be using, um, you, you may have uh, SCADA systems that are doing processing controls and they could shut down your manufacturing organization. So that isn't information, but it is what you do. And, and then, you know, you're not going to supply your customers and so forth. How does a how does a CISO get visibility into this? Do you share this responsibility with someone running OT? Do you bring it up to the executive committee? Uh, I mean, you can't ignore it. I think if you ignore it, yeah. you know, it may not hit your organization, but it's going to hit your company somehow. Yeah, I don't know if you got any thoughts on that. Yeah, the, well, the operative to... words operative words you use there, Tom, actually constitute the essence of the response, right? shared mm -hmm. responsibility, right? So, you know, for the cyber defenders who may not have responsibility for the OT network, right? They have to partner with whomever is running that side of the business to make sure that they do have, they're answering the know thyself question, right? right and right. they do have visibility across both IT and OT environments, right? Um, if again, for the CISOs that who have responsibility for both IT and OT goes without saying, right? You apply first principles to both environments, right? And again, it's not just what you have within your physical bricks and mortars, right? It's what's running in your off-prem environments as well, right? So your cloud, your hybrid cloud, and also of increasing importance, Tom, in light of you know, recent developments in the supply chain um, risk management perspective is you know, how much you know, interrogation should you have for your supply chain assets, especially your, your, your tier one, tier two vendors, right? You know, especially if they are directly connected to your you know, prem based system, right? Systems, right? So, you know, having that visibility about risks that you are assuming um, from your directly connected or indirectly connected network, whether those are within your immediate administrative purview or they're in the purview of trusted third parties, that ought to factor in your asset management strategy as well. Again, IT, OT, on prem cloud hosted um, or, or um, key components of your supply chain, right? Um, having as much visibility as you, I mean, you're not going to be, be able to manage them, right? Uh, same point in time, you know, not knowing means you're flying blind, right? And you're totally reactive to what might be happening in those environments, on those systems, and there could be adverse consequences for the systems within your immediate purview. So you gotta at least know thyself, right? Yeah, and I want to. There's a chat box. Thanks to Jackson uh, for this. That you know, where are VMs and cloud storage drives? S3 buckets are a significant risk. And I think, um, although we define what the asset is, and it it it, it does exist in cloud. And, you know, different forum with, with VMs and so forth, that three buckets. 
it needs to be called out uh, in, in, in the scope here and, and, and looked at. And we had discussion around this. In fact, we are uh, having continued discussion more to get into the, the, the cloud environment because there are tools there uh, and we're gonna have subsequent discussion on that in this task force as we, when we resume it, that, that are extremely important to do that. But I, I think we talk about that environment, which is very uh, different from our you know, traditional uh, data center environment. Uh, needs to be uh, included in the scope side of that. And, uh, and uh, as well as OT assets, IT assets, et cetera. Many companies are just catching up in their traditional data centers. I, I understand that, but you know, to be, have an effective program, you have to look at what you said with, from the third party supply side, as well as, as the cloud side. So Jackson makes a very good point. And so did you, Devin, thank you. So uh, let's talk about, um, I wanna uh, spend a few minutes talking about what the components of a good program are. Um, so if you don't have this in place, you definitely need executive uh, endorsement and oversight. Um, and from that standpoint is uh, you need, you're gonna involve multiple organizations, procurement, IT, security, uh, you need uh, executives to understand that all of us have to work together and you're gonna create uh, uh, responsibilities and sharing using technologies to make this work. Um, we talked about policies and procedures, definitely important for documentation as well as configuration standards. Roles and responsibilities, uh, we'll talk about that. The asset owner um, may be one or many in, in, in multiple responsibilities. Uh, multiple support systems, uh, discovery tools, procurement systems, uh, cloud-based tools. Um, again, if you're operating the cloud as well, asset registration and inventory, configuration management tools, security software, monitoring, alerting software. Um, one of the, one of the folks say is you, you, you're going to need some systems programming support to integrate these tools, maybe from the procurement system to the CMDB. Uh, and again, that could be people writing scripts. So you do need help doing that. Um, there'll be uh, life cycle processes that you need to run. When you're starting your program, um, again, it's very important that you have an objective for what you're trying to do. And we'll talk about it. I, you know, it, it may be that you don't do everything at once. You're maybe starting with your crown jewels and manage the assets there or a particular network segment. Uh, but if you haven't, uh, started anything, uh, members said you've got to develop some metrics and share them with the executive committees in terms of uh, what your objective is and where you're going. And the metrics example is a very simple example uh, of where you can begin to look at uh, assets registered to those um, that uh, basically have uh, are up to the uh, uh, standards that you, you put together, they're configured properly, and use a cumulative value to show, um, you know, cumulatively every month where you're going, and when you hit the objective line, you can do it. But it's very important, again, uh, for your program to establish metrics. Um, any other comments on this, Devin? Are these generally the, the main components, or did you want to highlight one or maybe add another? Yeah, these are all great points, Tom. Um, you know, not a tremendous lot to add here. Um, you know, if there's anything that I would probably noodle on a little bit, um, and it, you know, perhaps reflective of the state of industry, right, where now more and more of the CMDB, um, you know, asset management products coming to market are coming with very rich API libraries, right, um, and SDKs. So, you know, I don't believe that there's, as big a need for you know folks to hand jam code to get systems to talk to the CMDB, right? I think you know with the richness of the API that most of these products are bringing to market now off the shelf, it makes those integration points a lot easier. The metrics, it's, you know, as you said, very important. What gets measured gets improved, right? Um, and 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 you know, and and certainly you know, keen on. Um, key performance indicators or key risk indicators around IT asset management um, ought to factor into the metrics that 
a CISO, you know, tracks and report on, you know, for, for, for her organization, right? Um, you know, percentage coverage of assets, right? Especially network connected assets, right? You know, so having a robust NAP solution deployed to where every asset that's IP addressable, every asset that on the wires, if you will, gets fully instrumented. I mean, that, 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 that's got to be key, right? But then, you know, at the same point in time, you know, there are systems that will go like, you know, offline for DR purposes, right? Those still have to be accounted for, right? Um, systems that, that, that are maintained, you know, it, you know, disconnected on purpose, right? From a contingency perspective, you know, that all, those also have to be accounted for, but having a percentage coverage within a plus or minus tolerance rate that is consistent with the organization's risk appetite is pretty important for, you know, cyber execs to make sure they're tracking and reporting um, from a robust IT asset management strategy perspective. That's a very, very good point. I've, I've also seen when you establish metrics and you can use, uh, there are platforms like Splunk, Click and Tableau. I'm not promoting one or the other, but you know, there are many out there that you can use to, to, to actually do this. I've seen organizations that have actually put in an asset management program and then when they want to measure their performance to their CISOs, you know, in terms of patching and vulnerability management and fixing them, um, they've, by doing this, they started the basis of understanding where their issues are, and then they can create the executive metrics to measure, uh, you know, how well they're doing along various controls. So in other words, uh, they're not just using a maturity value. They're saying, here's a percent of the assets, particular assets that are now being covered and here's how well we're doing it. And they can come up with a more meaningful uh, number. Uh, you know, and that's that's the benefit of starting to measure and creating an, an asset management program when you turn it around to actually monitoring and report to executives. Um, so anyway, let's move on to the next slide. Um, I'm just gonna say in the implementation guide, uh, just for those uh, members of the organization, prospective members, uh, we do uh, provide guidance on how you want to prepare the program for success. Uh, there are a number of uh, uh, components to do that. Because first thing, if, if, if you haven't done this, you have to set it up properly. And there, um, step two is identifying closing the gaps. Because once you've identified the assets, you know, what, what, where are the gaps? How do I need to configure them? And then going forward, it's managing new assets. So... Here's the deal. You may uh, have a program in place and your challenge may be finding uh, new assets in different environments, as Gavin said, third parties or in cloud. Uh, but you, if you've set up the proper preparation steps and you've put in technologies and recognize that, you can continue to uh, enhance your program to move into those environments. And it's important that you do because Again, uh, they are targets uh, for, for threats and current threats. So uh, I'm just gonna go on. We do talk about life cycle phases um, in great detail. It's acquiring and registering the asset. It's configuring the asset. It's very important to a standard to monitor it, to implement it in terms of putting it in a change control, integrating it into the environment, operating and maintain it, daily operations, scanning, uh, patching, et cetera. And at the end, there is disposal of the particular asset, that, you know, verifying that the uh, information on it has been securely wiped. Um, you've verified that it's been backed up. Uh, logs have been retained. Uh, so there's a number of uh, different things. And for each of these five life cycles, just to say how we've gone into it, we describe it, we uh, say what the objectives are, we talked about procedures and processes, which ones you need to have in place, which systems uh, are gonna be important for you to make this life cycle phase work. And at the very end, we have a number of tips. What made this successful for members? Uh, what different advice and guidance uh, do they wanna provide? Um, and at the end, we come up with FAQs. And we're going to get into that now a little bit. And I'll conclude with key takeaways and we can get into the 
audience Q and, A, Q and A's. So uh, maybe you can help me with this. We do provide some guidance, uh, Devin, but your experience, expertise are always welcome here. Um, one question was the role of the asset owner is often confusing and ineffective. And how, how can I, you know, how can I define that role to be an effective part of, of an ITAM program? And let me put this in context, especially in older attempts, or I'd say attempts years ago to put this together. Uh, auditors would always come in and say, you got to define an asset owner. And then the next step someone would do was try to come up with a spreadsheet of people's names on all different assets and realize, okay, well, uh, someone else is owning the uh, malware, you know, uh, agents on this, someone's doing this and that. Um, and now we got to rewrite job descriptions. Okay, so what do they do? It means that there's a security problem, they're responsible, should they bring it to our attention? It became so confusing that it never ever got done. Yet the concept is still there of an owner, but I, you know, again, no one can own every aspect of, of that particular uh, device. So I don't know um, if you have any uh, uh, advice and guidance on this side. We can say that, you know, uh, maybe, maybe assign uh, uh, one to own it, but the monitoring of it is another organization. So if there's a problem, the owner becomes one to escalate the problem too and those uh, providing services to that owner then are responsible for um, ensuring, uh, shoring up those services. But anyway, uh, I don't want to throw a curveball here, uh, but uh, Devin, any thoughts on this to maybe some, uh, to clarify how, how can you make an asset owner effective? Yeah, um, you know, this um, is often, Tom, to your point, you know, one of the, Achilles heels, if you will, of, you know, any robust IT asset management um, program. It's, you know, the own asset ownership, right? And how do you define that? Um, it goes back to one of the first principles you outlined earlier, right? Executive sponsorship and endorsement of the program, right? You know, as CISOs, many of us still report into a CIO, right, or a CRO or, you know, some other, you know, ranking exec within the organization with top level responsibility and accountability for IT operations across that organization, right? If IT asset management is, is made a priority for the organization, right, and there's top down support, right, many of these, no, I don't own it, I just own the box, I don't own what runs on it, somebody else owns that, and oh, I'm the application owner, but I'm not the data owner, a lot of that stuff, a lot that causes a lot of churn between teams at the, you know, fourth and fifth layers down within the organization will get resolved. Right. So I think, you know, the, the first point you made there from an implementation perspective is executive level sponsorship, executive level endorsement. And to make this a priority for the IT organization, right, or wherever the accountability lies for this will certainly help to resolve a lot of the process and procedural churn that happens at the lower levels within the organization. I think it's always easier to identify who's the owner for the physical asset that responds to that, the TCP IP packets across the wire, right? You know, who's the server, who's the owner for that asset, right? But then everything else that reside on that quote unquote asset. I mean, you know, one of the questions is about virtual machines, right? Spinning those up, spinning those down, and then the applications that are running on those virtual machines, right? And the data, right, that's being processed within those VMs, right? How do you trace and track and hold accountable, you know, owners for each of those assets, right, that resides on top of the physical device. The physical device piece is relatively easy in most organization. The, the layers above the physical sometimes is where the complexity lies. But again, you know, Tom, if you've got executive endorsement, and this is a priority for that CIO or CRO of the organization, a lot of these churn issues will get resolved. I think that's a, a very good point. We could talk about this forever. Do you think as a CISO, um, recognizing you may not have visibility into the OT environment, as for example, BYOD environments, 
should you as a CISO go to the OT owners as well and collectively go to the executives and say, we need to look at this holistically, those, those operating in the cloud? I mean, it, it almost has to be brought up, right, to the level to, to bring everything in scope, right? Um, yeah. Um, it's a balance so for CISOs, I think, too, but anyway, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So I would say, Tom, you know, so you mentioned cloud and I see that um, it depends on, you know, how and the context for use of that, because, you know, from my perspective, you know, cloud is typically a core component of IT operations for most organizations, right? right. Um, you know, certainly, um, you know, cloud is also used in OT uh, and support OT initiatives, depending on, you know, market vertical and particular company imperatives, right? Um, the distinction that I would make there is, you know, what's in that CISO's remit, right? Um, mm -hmm. Is it limited to IT or is it, does it also extend to OT, right? right. Um, right. And certainly I would also add this, this as the additional caveat, not just what's in that CISO's remit, but the implications for, um, you say, ransomware attacks against an OT environment that could advert impact return on shareholder values, you know, um, questions and concerns from, from the regulators, um, and on and on and on, right? Company brand and reputation, right? That CISO has to take it upon herself, himself, to have the conversation with whomever within that company is responsible for securing the OT environment, much like, you know, her or him would for securing the IT environment. Cloud, I mean, to me, I, I don't make a distinction between what's on-prem, what's in the cloud, as long as it pertains to security period, right? And that includes some of the earlier mentions about VMs, containers, all that. They're supporting key business imperatives. Those business imperatives rely on IT or OT. And so the same kind of considerations have to be intended, extended um, to them. So that's how I'd think about it, Tom. Hopefully that makes sense. Oh. Excellent, thanks. I'm going to just uh, bring up the next uh, two questions um, quickly. And in, in three minutes, I'm gonna ask Connor to put up the poll questions because we're, we're running out of time. We'll, we'll, we'll have a chance to get to the Q&A. There are a few questions in there and we can get to one of the questions I think uh, right now. But reducing the risks that the program will fail uh, because of the size. I, you know, some members said they, uh, I'll give you an example of, of what one member did to do that. They said, I'm going to start focusing on software licensing. Now, of course, you know, we worry about security too, and, and they did get to that. But they said, I'm going to start with that, put in a good process to identify assets and move to the hardware side and the rest of the, the program things. And they succeeded. Uh, they also uh, got some outside expertise to do it not recommending that or who, but you know, they said that they wanted someone that knew how to do this in an organization uh, and took the politics out of it. So I just offered that as an example. I, I don't know. I mean, so defining, a, a, you know, rather than trying to crack the entire, maybe just defining an area where you can, you, you can begin and then work out from there as, as you would do in good project management. So where, as you said, where are the crown jewels? Let's work on that. And maybe it's in a network servers are segmented. Let's start there and then work, you know, work, you know, once we get the process down, we can move it to other areas. Um, so that I would, was, I would just I quickly know, add I mean, Tom that yep. the CIS controls one and two, right, are considered foundational controls for a reason, right? Um, you know, I guess, you know, I'll defer to whomever went with the software licensing as, you know, their, you know, their, their major risk reduction initiative. But I would say that, you know, knowing what you have from a hardware asset and software asset perspective, consistent with what's in, you know, CIS foundational control number one, number two, are there for a reason. And it goes back to our open remarks. You can't defend what you don't know about. You can't protect what you can't see, right? So to me, those are foundational for very good reasons. Yeah. And I, I would start there. I have to agree with you. And it's a hard thing, I think, you know, getting, getting one's arms around. It's a hard thing for CISOs to do, but it is essential. It is essential. It, you know, it's probably the hardest thing you've got to involve different organizations and constituencies and shadow IT, 
and it's tough. You got a lot to worry about every day, but I, I would agree with you. you. You have to reach out, look at all the environments and as tough as that is. And, you know, again, I, I encourage the collaboration and support you'll get from other members by, by being in this group to do that. Last thing uh, before we'll put up the poll questions is how do I choose which tools to support my program? And there was a question, how, uh, what is the best way to discover unknown assets? There are uh, discovery tools. I, I don't have them listed here, but uh, uh, there, are, there are many tools out there, right? <laughs> I, I, I guess right now. I think you brought to the point that they are getting better with APIs and providing uh, software capabilities to integrate other, uh, to accept other types of inter information, and integrate with other tools. Um, but uh, uh, you may have some, they may have some tools in place, right? I mean, one of the first thing is see, see what you, you might have that you might not be using in terms of discovery tools before you yep. go out and buy a lot. The other thing too is, uh, and uh, tongue in cheek, but I mean this, join join the collaborative and, and we'll, you know, we get discussions of those. <laughs> Sorry. We'll, no, we'll, I mean, we'll, we're not, I mean, we, we chuckle <laughs> at it, but you know, you sure, know you it's an important it. point. It's an yeah. important point, right? Because what I, my response to that, Tom, would have been solicit the wisdom of the crowds. Oh, right? You're that. not going to be solving a problem that's so unique to your organization that nobody else has tackled this before. Pick up the phone, call somebody, right? Get your circle of trust, right? You're not the only one facing the IT asset management challenge, the asset, this, you know, the, the unidentified network connected asset challenge. How are your peer, you know, cyber practitioners solving for that, right? Whether it's an IT or OT environment. So solicit the wisdom of the crowds and don't believe that you have to tackle this alone because your environment is so unique. So entities like the task force, right? You know, helps with that. It's pulling together practitioners from diverse industries, diverse, you know, you know critical infrastructure sectors, the, you know, different sizes of organization, ge geographic footprint, solicit the wisdom of the crowds. That's, that would be my advice to that. I think that's important. And here you can, you, you know, the crowds have similar interests and are willing to share their experiences. They don't have any uh, conflict of interest with vendors per se or any, anything that they're trying to promote other than, uh, you know, this is what worked for me and this is how it worked and this is how I configured it. It's in this environment that we offer you a chance to actually talk about these tools. So I think that that's a, a good way to, to help make your choice, you know, is reach out by being part of this organization. And thank you, Kevin, for that. Uh, Connor, do you want to go ahead and put up the, uh, uh, so we don't miss it, the, the uh, uh, there you go, the polls. Uh, we'll let members, and while we're doing that, I'll, while you're answering this, I'll kind of walk through some key takeaways. And this presentation is available to all. Um, just a few things, why executive support uh, is absolutely critical. We've talked about it several times. Participation and accountability from business and IT organizations. This is a multi-organization effort requirement and foundational for any security program, as Devin has mentioned. Um, it's a long-term continuously enhanced effort. Don't think of it as something that's, uh, uh, you know, one and done. It's, it's, uh, it's something you can continue Start with short-term achievable goals. Uh, again, don't give up there. You have, to, you have to really look at your entire asset base to manage it. It's foundational. You're gonna use integration, uh, integrate multiple technologies. Uh, there are many technologies out there that are continually being enhanced and addressing this problem. But obviously, does it work for you? And as I said, you know, reach out to your collaborative members to figure that one out. And you might want to start with the highest risk areas with the most sensitive data and the highest value areas uh, to begin. Um, so members are uh, continuing to please uh, complete the uh, poll. I just want to then move on to uh, the fact that uh, we have other task forces that are, are now uh, being developed and are, are operating are raising, and I, we put that in quotes, it means destroying, not, uh, not facilitating ransomware. Uh, we are having uh, some very, very good conversations or 
we're sort of in the beginning phases of this. We're looking to conclude and present in December. I guarantee you this task force will reemerge early next year and continue to look for ways to support our membership. Um, we're looking, uh, we're having some uh, great discussions. We're looking to put together a best practices guide um, and also prepare a questionnaire, including uh, call outs to third party questionnaires on their ransomware programs. Our third party management questionnaire does have some call outs to that, but we're looking to expand that. Uh, you know, because uh, we're finding out that uh, and members have said third parties have had ransomware attacks that have affected supply, potentially spam emails into the company, uh, and that's important. We're looking at management board communication templates. You know, how do you call out the risks and how and the threats and how we're addressing them? Uh, we're also looking to put a uh, uh, instant response playbook together, including a pay. Uh, no pay decision criteria, which we've already begun doing. And to the right, if you look at the right side of the slide, these are, we're going into great depth on key controls, um, backup recover being one, uh, but, but there are many, many other controls in terms of you know, how effective they are, uh, how much cost does it take to put in place? What assets do they cover? What technologies are required? Um, you know, what vendors are, are used. We're having great discussions. Backup and recovery is, is key, but there are other things. There's EDR, uh, there, uh, you know, you can lock down administrative access, et cetera. So we're looking to, uh, to get into that. So it's a, it's a very active, uh, you know, plenty of time to have new members join and existing members, uh, but it's something that we're going to provide great value to our membership with. And then, uh, you know, we, we do engage uh, Devin, who's been on the executive committee, and others to talk about what, what areas the CISO is facing. Um, zero trust is, a, is an area that we'll be uh, uh, going into. Third party incident response, in other words, uh, not your third parties and how they respond, but how you, know, you engage them in response. Uh, and what are they doing? Because that more and more is becoming a, a, an issue. So we're gonna we're gonna delve into the instant response side, instant management. Uh, and, you know, again, looking at third parties, talent and staffing is another area. You know, how to maintain and engage uh, staff, have them grow. Uh, we had executives really, really get involved in that and say what was important. So uh, anyway. Uh, and we're looking at uh, producing some other, uh, a number of different task force for next year. So I'm gonna do this, uh, get, contact us. Here's the contact number. If you're not a member, but wanna get a copy of the presentation and learn more about, about us, we really want you to join and participate in this. I think you'd find it very exciting and valuable. Uh, we did get the, the poll questions. Um, you do get one CPE for this. Uh, let's take a look at the, in the chat box. Uh, what are the determining factors involved in deciding what assets should or should not operate online? That's a uh, that's a good one. I would say if they're not up to snuff, right? <laughs> they don't have the proper controls on them. But maybe that's maybe that's too, too much of an obvious response. Uh, any thoughts on that question, Devin? Perhaps. Um, I. I'm sorry, Tom, I missed the question. Oh, sure, I'm sorry. The question is, what are the determining factors involved in deciding what assets should be, uh, should operate online or not? And my, my response was that until they have uh, been properly configured, they don't get up and running. I mean, they're not spun up, but. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, the yeah. other binary response to that is, is it you know, company owned or not? Right, oh, that's um, a, company that's issued or not? Yeah. Is there is it sanctioned B Y O D or not? Right? Yeah. Is it sanctioned shadow T or not? Right? So a lot has to do with you know what's authorized versus not. Um, SCADA should SCADA yeah. be online? That's a big question. We can have a whole nother discussion on that. <laughs> right? Yeah, Obviously, yeah. you know, separate <laughs> networks. Right, depend on sensitivity um, would certainly you know make sense in most regards, right? Um, but yeah, that's a uh, uh, perhaps a much bigger question, Zachary, than we have time for today. Uh, I think a very important one. Maybe maybe you know it's worth an OG team on this because 
Yeah, I've seen SCADA systems be online and uh, I've actually seen a plant, uh, an oil refinery uh, temperature went up and boom, you know? So yes, it, it, it's a serious and important topic. So Zachary, thank you for bringing it up. Uh, as they say, you know, psychologist says, I'm sorry, we're out of time. <laughs> I can't really talk to, sorry, our time is up. Uh, we'll talk next week, but we do, it is an important question. Seriously, thank you. And uh, we, we will certainly raise it as, as a, for further discussion in this group. Listen, again, Devin, your insights were invaluable today and your time and support is, is always uh, welcome. As was yours, Tom. As well was yours. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Wish you well in your new endeavors and we'll always want you to be uh, with us and, and su support us as you have been. And I want to thank everyone for sharing an hour with us today. We hope this was valuable. Uh, for our members, you can uh, get a copy of this uh, guidance document on the portal. For non-members, uh, please contact us and, and we can uh, talk a little bit about membership and some of the content we reproduced and where we're going. So with that, I'll leave it on that. Connor, thank you for running this in perfect. And please, everyone, have a wonderful afternoon. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you.